All right, first of all, I'd like to thank Stampley for the opportunity to participate in this podcast series. Uh, for those of you who are not aware of who the DeWinter Group is, uh, my name is Derek DeWinter, uh, one of the founders of the firm, which celebrated its 20th year in business last year. Um, today, we number a little over 90 employees in three offices throughout the Bay Area and uh, do search work in both finance, accounting, and technology for permanent, retained, and consulting-related uh, work. Uh, I have the incredible fortune of working with two great friends and strong professionals, uh, Mike Tomasello and Don Seeley, uh, Mike being one of the co-founders, and uh, we have worked together for over 20 years, so I'm hoping that this feels like a friendly conversation at the end of a bar over a couple of cold beers, um, and this is right about the time where you should queue up some John Cougar Mellencamp or something like that. And uh, Don and Mike, I'll uh, encourage you to make a quick introduction of yourselves, if you don't mind. Mike, why don't you go first? Sure. Uh, Mike Tomasello. I started the firm with Derek back in 2000. We had worked at a firm prior together, uh, both of us starting our careers in public accounting originally. Uh, we uh, began as a re predominantly contingent search firm. And in 2008, we started the interim staffing side and project work uh, with the DeWinter consulting team. Um, and about 2017, we started technology and the firm has grown significantly um, over the past probably five to eight years to be probably one of the larger privately held staffing firms in the Bay Area. So we've been super proud of that and uh, we look forward to kind of continuing our growth and potentially moving uh, geographically and building our technology practice to the size of our finance and accounting practice. Over to you, Don. Fun times. All right, Don Seeley, a uh, failed former finance professional, fall, fell backwards into recruiting uh, here with Derek and Mike. Uh, I've been doing recruiting in the Bay Area for 23, 24 years now, as have both of these gentlemen. So really long history and, and deep expertise uh, in our core areas of uh, specialty, which is finance, accounting, and technology. I'm just really proud of what we've built here, starting from a <clears throat> tiny little office on the Alameda with bean bags and uh, secondhand Mexican pine furniture, uh, all the way up to 90 employees and three offices and uh, a really nice footprint and, and brand uh, here locally. So very proud of what we've, been, what we've been able to build together. Thanks, guys. So the the baseline for this conversation is is I guess to take the seventy five years of knowledge that we have, and try to impart that um, in some sort of way, shape, or form uh, for the listeners. And and to get things rolling, um, I wanted to kind of I want to talk a little bit about something that we have prepared for the past five years. I think it's been five years, which is a compensation or controller report, uh, which you know basically talks about the current state of play for a CFO or a controller's organization. Um, and I'll let Mike talk about this because he's really led the effort in developing this report year after year, uh, with last year being arguably the most challenging time to pull together something that, um, <laughs> that involved a little bit of a crystal ball too. So Mike, why don't you share a little bit about, um, uh, about the controller report? Sure. Our controller report is essentially was originally made to be a survey, a salary survey to give people a better idea of what's happening in the marketplace with respect to market values for people's salaries at different levels of jobs within different disciplines. Um, that evolved into more of a marketing tool that still included the salary information, but also marketed the firm and talked a little bit more qualitatively about the economy as a whole in the Bay Area. Uh, the data came from obviously, well, not obviously, but sending out information or questionnaires to our candidate pool, which is quite vast, probably in the 18 to 20,000 person range. Um, and we probably would get uh, responses in the two to 3,000 range that were full and accurate. Uh, so it gave us a pretty good idea of what was happening in the Bay Area. Um, we have not done it yet for technology to a large extent, but we, we do have enough data that this year coming up, we will include that. Um, it, it was interesting to see how we broke out the information between pub private and public companies. Uh, we broke it out between um, finance and accounting within those disciplines. And again, next year we'll break out into technology, but it's a pretty thorough analysis of the, of the market. Um, and we also find it to be, again, a great marketing tool because we can talk a little bit about what's happening at the firm where we see things going in a macroeconomic scale as well. 
So it's, it's been a pretty wonderful tool for us uh, and will continue to be going forward. Yeah, and certainly one of the really challenging things last year was taking that historical data and trying to fast forward and anticipate what was going to happen. And since we aggregated this data in the fall of 2020, there was there's never been a time in our history of the organization, maybe the history of the Bay Area or the nation, where you could have reasonably predicted what was going to happen two, three, six, nine months out. So, um, you know, with that uh, as kind of a, a baseline, Don, return to office, back to normal, trends in the future. Uh, what are some of the things that you are seeing out there as you talk to clients, as you talk to our, um, our employees about what back to normal might look like? Yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting. There's a, there's a, an old New Yorker cartoonist, Charles Adams. And one of his quotes was, you know, normal is an illusion. What's normal to the spider is chaos for the fly. And I think that there is actually a lot of chaos in some very specific verticals here, hospitality and leisure and transportation. But, um, you know, so when we say back to normal in the Bay Area, what is, you know, what does that really mean? It, you know, the Bay Area is known for being super dynamic and, and ever-changing, ever-present. That The industries that we work on now were in no one's eye, right, 20 years ago or 25 years ago when the three of us first started. So I think that is, you know, that is normal. Um, I guess we align very, very closely with at the macro level with, with funding and exits, right? And so that's one of the really beautiful things about the Bay Area is that, you know, over the first half of this year, there's just been an explosion of deployed capital, um, second half of 2020 was 180 billion worldwide. The first half of 21 is already at 300 billion. That includes all investor classes, VC, growth equity, PE, hedge, pension, you know, you name it. And so as long as that money is coming in and the ideas are there, the, the companies will be starting and uh, the needs will be present in terms of hiring. So what's going back to normal? I think it is, you know, some sense of, you know, great ideas are still being funded, companies are still being created, hiring needs uh, are still uh, occurring on a very regular and accelerated basis. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's what we're seeing. There is absolutely no slowdown uh, anywhere in the Bay Area when it comes to, to, to hiring and recruiting. And maybe, Mike, for you, something that's even more complicated, which even as I wrote these notes out, you know, when we started talking about this podcast a couple of weeks ago, I find the notes that I wrote down are not as relevant as I thought <laughs> as they are today based on new information that we have in front of us. And that's return to office, which is as complicated a topic, even internally for us with 90 employees and three offices. Um, it is vastly more difficult for our multinational clients. Um, you can maybe talk a little bit about some of the things that we're thinking about, but you know, maybe also talk about return to office as you see it out in the marketplace with the data that you're pulling in. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit at the macro level. I mean, clearly there's a huge big unknown about obviously the COVID viruses and the, the variants that are occurring and how that's going to affect the workplace and people going back to work. Um, you know, I think it's we're seeing in, in the current environment that we really just don't know. I think it's really difficult for these companies, and I'm talking at the level of Apple and Google, to assess this and say, look, you know, this is exactly what our policy is going to be. I, I don't think you can set a policy um, until we kind of have a little bit more concrete understanding of where the pandemic is heading, if it's good, as it tapers off or as we run into new variants. But uh, I, I think what we're seeing is people pulling back currently on what they were trying to do at the end of the summer which was get back in the office to some degree. And for most of our clients, that meant a, a, you know, a partial week in the office, two to three days in the office, and then the rest is a work from home model. Um, I'm familiar with a company that is, had a, the intent to have people voluntarily go back in August and in September potentially go to a schedule that was two to three days a week. And now they've pulled back, I'm sorry, they've pulled back both of those ideas because now they don't know what's gonna happen. I think what we're going to see in the future is this continue, but I also think we've shown 
as a society and especially in the Bay Area, how effective we can be at home. So I think businesses are going to have to decide what's important to their employees. I think employees are going to have a much bigger say in how the workplace works going forward. Um, it, it, you know, Working from home allows you to do a lot of personal things that you probably couldn't do in the past because of commutes or whatever it may be. And I think people are finding that to be hugely advantageous. Um, well, Mike, I think we could agree that you know your voice as an employee gets amplified in a market where you have more power. And right now in a candidate poor market uh, or where there's a candidate shortage, employees have a big say, um, much more than they might in a reverse of a situation. Um, anecdotally, I think it's, it's an interesting thing to think about the Bay Area relative to other parts of the country and the market. We believe we're a fantastic place and the best place in the world and we have all the best ideas, but what we do isn't what other parts of the country are doing. And I had a conversation this morning uh, with a firm like ours um, in the middle of the country that is having a very difficult time um, staffing companies or staffing employees at companies who are too flexible with candidates. Uh, with, well, I'm sorry, with employees that, that work there, meaning if they have a very lax policy on working um, in the office, meaning you can work at home as much as you want, those are searches that they're having a more difficult time filling, which is the complete opposite of what we see uh, in the Bay Area. So it's just interesting what we see and what the rest of the country sees are, are, are two different things. Uh, and it's important, I think, to remember that. But, you know, based on based on what we're seeing out there, this is a, a the return to office um, solution is not going to be answered anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, and I, and I think that there's a lot of variables that we have to consider in that. I mean, you talk about your middle America client, you know, they may have a younger staff that wants to be in the office. And that's where the younger people actually have their social network built is with who they meet in the office. You know, it's hard for us to even compare internally because we have a lot of established salespeople with young families who it's advantageous for them to work from home. Um, and I worry about developing our younger people because it's good for them to be in the office. So there's a lot of variables that a lot of these companies are going to have to go into to figure out what the best fit for them is. But I do think they have a lot of flexibility and I do think it's going to be trial and error. Um, yeah. but I do think, I, I do think a, geographically a speaking, like we have had more employees that have taken the opportunity to move a little bit further away from the epicenter of the office where they, people generally wanted to live right near where they could commute to because traffic is not good in the Bay Area. If you are in... Tulsa, Oklahoma, commuting is not that big of a deal. Uh, there's, not, there's only so far you can move away. And so I think that that's one singular issue that they don't have to deal with. Um, and I'm picking on Tulsa, but it could be anything, but, um, uh, lots of different cities. Uh, but I don't know that's, that's certainly one thing that we have to contend with. Well, we have the unique situation too of being one of the yep. highest price, priced places in the country, if not the world. So you know, when you're 32 years old in our in our business and you want to go buy a house and you can work remotely, this gives you an opportunity. So it's, you know, there's a lot, again, a lot of variables that go into it. Yeah, I think uh, it, just to hop in here, there are uh, some real on the ground stats that we're seeing from a very large sample size that extends all the way back to what I would call last fall forward, you know, as, as companies and the economy got their feet underneath them again and said, okay, or it looks like this is kind of the new normal, as you said, Derek. And so how do we, how do we plan and account for this? And at that point, De Winter in, in a fairly conservative vertical, which is finance and accounting was, was working with fully remote jobs at about 5%. Right now, about 30% of our open positions are fully remote. Right, so <clears throat> think about that increase, and that number is only going up month to month as we're tracking it. And I also think a big thing that you want to almost separate a little bit is when you're hiring in this market, flexibility uh, and that option to work from home is a conversation that is on the table from the jump. And so companies are negotiating that component right up front. I think where the big settling out is, and this is true for us internally as well, is what, you know, where are all of these employees, the 70 people that, you know, we had, the 75 people that we had before COVID, 
what are they all going to do? And I think that's what a lot of companies are dealing with, right? Is you've, you've got this new class of hires where this flexibility and this work from home is always an option, always on the table, always negotiated. And then you have this whole entire class of people that were already your employees and they have to shake out, right? They have to shake out into fully remote, partially remote, fully in the office. And I think that's what a lot of companies are kind of dealing with. And that's the struggle of the policy is how do you build a policy that incorporates both what you're trying to do to attract talent in the marketplace and a very competitive marketplace with, you know, what you're giving the employees who have been around yep. for. Well, you, know, you mentioned um, a little bit about um, some of the, at least one statistic about 30% of our, um, of the jobs that we're working on right now are fully remote. Can you talk a little bit about the other, you know, classes, whether it's hybrid or fully in the office, um, do you have kind of data to pull off the top of your head with that, Don? Yeah, I do. We, internally, we separate them into three general buckets, and I would call that, you know, fully in the office. Um, that may include one day a week from home. Um, and then the middle one is we're requiring two or three days in the office, and then fully remote is you know, we're not requiring anything. You can, you can literally live anywhere. Um, less than 10% of our clients are in that first bucket where they are requiring fully in the office. Okay, and primarily those are in industries that are sometimes, you, you know, require something. Uh, different from the rest of their employees than finance and accounting. We see that a lot in biotech, in pharma, where their scientists or their lab technicians or these people like actually have to be in the office. And so I think there's a constraint there on building a policy that is consistent across their entire organization as opposed to those people really not being able to do that job or that function from home. So 10% of the, the organizations out there full-time in the office, no, you know, no excuses. Um, and then the rest of that, the 60% that's left over from the 30% fully remote and 10% fully in is, you know, some amount of flexibility. And those situations vary. It could be, you know, one day a week in the office, could be a couple days a week in the office, but most people are as Mike alluded to earlier, still trying to feel out what that policy is going to look like, given you know health guidelines, all of these other things that are coming down both from the state and national mandates and and what they feel comfortable with as an individual company so um, I think it's TBD just about everybody at this point is still working fully remote mm -hmm. uh, and the question now becomes in the fall. Uh, or as time goes on, like what does that hybrid office environment actually look like as a policy? You know, I think we're all still trying to figure that one yeah, out. Yeah, well, just we had a healthy debate just yesterday, two days ago, on the topic internally that felt a little bit different than the one we had a month prior. And I think no right. doubt a month from now we will have different set of data to be able to apply to the same conversation and. A month out from that, it might be the same, unfortunately. So I think uh, flexibility is key for sure. Well, um, everybody loves to make predictions. I recall actually writing out some form of prediction for our 2019 controller report that could not have been more incorrect. <laughs> it was just astonishingly wrong, although I could not have predicted um, a COVID-19 variant or whatever for 2020. Um, so get out your crystal ball, um, both of you, and I will start with you, Don. Um, use some instincts, use your, you know, use your 25 years in the business, um, the data that you have in front of you, and maybe talk a little bit about hiring plans and future demand and you know the hiring footprint that you see for the clients that we're working with right now, uh, going through the rest of the year, maybe into 2022. Yeah, I mean, no, no slowdown. Uh, anywhere in sight, right, for the Bay Area. I think one of the reasons we all love working here, living here, and and being very tech adjacent, even though we're not, you know, actually a technology company, um, we've worked with, you know, some of the most amazing technology companies in the world. We've had the good fortune to, to staff these things when they were very small before they blew up and became public multi-billion dollar organizations. And I think that's one of the reasons we enjoy this ecosystem, right, is it is dynamic, it is ever-changing, it is um, highly adaptable, and 
and so that is going to continue right like the the continue the uh, the industries the verticals that the, the type of technology that um you know capital is being deployed to and that uh by by default we are now working with as clients is very 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 different than it was 5 years ago 10 years ago 15 years ago and we're going to continue to to support wherever that that money leads and wherever that uh, innovation uh starts heading so I'm excited about that. Like, what are the takeaways? I, I, I think having having a really, really good hiring game plan, and and this is almost off the topic of our compensation report, which I think filled a real need for local information. A lot of that information was uh, drawn up nationally and didn't really account for the uh, the highly specific nature of the Bay Area. But focusing on what you can pull away from our compensation report is you know, to what what are people valuing in the market? You know, what are the real hot um, functions and job duties? If you if your hiring plan and hiring map includes some of those positions, how do you um, position your company and your opportunity in the best possible light? And that's you know by being very creative, uh, being very flexible, uh, maybe looking at some kinds of backgrounds or people in geographies that you might not have looked at a year ago. Uh, and we've had a lot of success uh, with introducing clients to those types of candidates and profiles. And I think that's a net win, right, is, is getting other people, getting more um, involvement in the Bay Area ecosystem. Like Derek said, it can be very insular. So it's good to pull people in from different geographies, different backgrounds, different kind of industry um, profiles to to get a taste and and kind of broaden the perspective a little bit locally. So hopefully that answered the question. Absolutely, Michael. So I'm going to go a little bit more macro and drop some bombs here because I really think that we are at a crossroads on how the work is done. Uh, not necessarily here in the Bay Area, but everywhere. I think in the country, we may even see it all over the world if we haven't already seen it in Europe. Uh, we're not going back to the office full time. I don't think that's ever going to happen. I'm just going to, this is my crystal ball. So, you know, um, I, I just feel like there's so much opportunity for employees now to have a real say in how work is done. And I don't think employees are going to look at the balance that they've achieved, uh, you know, ironically during COVID and say, hey, I want to go back to five days, 40 hours a week in the office. Um, they've proven that they can be effective and very productive. So, you know, and this is more in line with the clients and, and candidates that we work with. Um, I think the Bay Area is going to really struggle with finding talent within the Bay Area to meet the demand. Um, and a lot of that is driven by the fact that there's so much money here in the Bay Area, so many companies, so much of a need for expertise that it's just going to be very, very difficult to find the people that they're looking for to satisfy their requirements. So I do see people at pretty senior levels getting hired remotely because they have a skill set that they can they can offer the Bay Area. And I see them, I see companies here saving a little bit of money by paying out of Bay Area salaries, but not that much. And finally, the thing I see that's really going to happen are footprints for these companies. You know, especially these guys who are looking to make the dollar go further that they get from investors. Why go rent 10,000 square feet when I can rent 3,000 square feet um, and be as effective and again, and as productive and profitable. So I, I think we're going to see a lot of changes in that area over the next couple of years, regardless of, of the COVID and the, and the pandemic. I just don't think that it was the catalyst, but I don't think it'll necessarily be the reason going forward. Um, and, you know, echoing what Don said, you know, there's always going to be, this is two years of unbridled hiring. I foresee in the next couple of years, we, this is the best we've ever seen it. It's not slowing down. Um, I, it's just, it's frankly crazy and, and in a good way for, for work and, and companies around here. It's just, can you get the talent that you really need to run your organization? And I think that's going to be a challenge. The way we did search work 20 years ago is not that much different than what we do today. Our clients ask for something that they want and we try to go find it. And clients always want a perfect profile of a candidate, ideally. And perfect profiles very rarely exist. Um, and so, you know, I, I would never tell a client to you know, look for s imperfections, but I think you should be okay with some imperfections because 
looking for perfect is going to mean you're going to be looking for a long, long time and maybe not ever find it. And that was true 15 years ago. That was true 10 years ago. But it's really, really true now um, in spades. It is, it is the most difficult hiring environment I have ever seen. And I've been doing this for 25 years. And I said that statement a number of years ago, and it was true then. But now it's really, really, <laughs> it is absolutely on fire. Um, yeah. And so, you know, my own kind of uh, recommendation or takeaway is that, and it's some, one of the things that we talked about today is like being flexible, being nimble, acting quickly. It's okay to make some mistakes. It's okay to break a few eggs, you know, waiting on the sidelines too long means that your competitors are doing something that you're not. And in a, in a war for talent in a race to get talent in a race to get products out the door, um, in a reasonable time frame, um, quarter over quarter, you wait too long and you're going to get passed up. And so I think you being very flexible in an environment that has always prized flexibility and nimbleness is never more true today than, uh, is never more true today. So has never been more true today. Let's put it that way. Um, any, any closing comments, um, guys specifically? Um, not a lot. I mean, I, again, I think we're going to see the changes that we saw during during the pandemic will probably continue on. And again, not because of the pandemic, but because employees are realizing that they have a they've actually gained some leverage on how the workplace is conducted. So I, I hope that employers are conscientious of that and really make an effort to find a really happy medium where they can maintain production and keep their employees happy. Um, I'd, lo I'd love to see that going forward. And certainly um throughout the country not just in yeah, i think it is a it, it, it's it's hard work to reimagine what work looks like right it, it was a routine it was uh something that you almost did unconsciously for years and years and you're talking to three guys here who did it for 30 years right whether it was in a career before recruiting or even in a recruiting career and and, and i think this this has been a little bit of a wake-up call that there can be a reimagining and sometimes uh you need a catalyst for that and and i wish it wasn't a global pandemic but i i am grateful for the catalyst of a reimagining and a rebalancing of the way that things work i i actually you know last year was hard for a lot of people because there was no boundary between work and home and you know child care was really difficult i have young children as well and all of that jumbled together was was really really difficult to maneuver. Um, I do see a path forward though where employees are going to be able to reclaim some of that lost commuting time, some of that lost time and, and really apply it to their own lives, right? Balance their own lives in a more meaningful way. And I think that reimagining is, is something that companies should take into account when they're hiring. Um, you know, great hires come in a variety of disguises, but I, I love Mike's uh, discussion about leverage because I, any any fantastic candidate right now uh, has the ability to generate five to ten offers. The, that is no hyperbole. Uh, there are literally that many positions available at any level. Um, and, and so companies from that standpoint really need to do what they can, I think. And it used to be you know, here are the perks that we're going to give you when you come into Google, right? There's a ping pong table and there's beer bashes and there's a bunch of free food. And I think that's shifting a little bit. People's priorities are shifting a little bit into, you know, what are some of those other mental health perks, uh, flexibility perks, work from home perks. And I think the more you can separate yourself as a company and as a, <clears throat> a hiring manager uh, in those ways, I think the more successful you're going to be. Of course, um, you know, everybody's always uh, focused on what your company is doing and, and their trajectory and their run rate as well. So it helps to be somewhere successful. But, uh, you know, I do think that that's a much bigger component uh, than yeah. it used to be. Well, and obviously compensation, which kind of ties us back to our compensation and control report. So, though, so for those that are interested in having a copy of that, if you've not seen it um, to date, you can reach out to Mike, Don, or I at any point in time, and we can make sure that you have that. Um, and, uh, and additionally, if you have any questions about the DeWinter Group and the services that we can provide to you and your organization, whether they're permanent, whether they're retained, whether they're contract in both finance, accounting, and HR and technology, 
Uh, we uh, would love to hear from you um, and, uh, and happy to share any and all information that we can provide to you to make uh, your organization that much more successful. So uh, thanks for taking the time to listen. Thanks, guys, for showing up and sharing a cold beer with me at the end of the bar. Uh, and we'll, uh, I'll see you. Actually, I may actually see both of you this weekend, Thanks. but uh, we'll see you guys soon. See you guys. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye.